Good morning. Welcome to the House Policy Committee. This is our eighth hearing in a series of trying to uh, travel across Pennsylvania and strengthening Pennsylvania's middle class, see what we can do better as a commonwealth for job growth, find out what it is that we may be doing well, and speak with some of our economic developers and those who do hiring agencies, as well as some of the different uh, agricultural communities that we were in down in Lancaster earlier this week. I want to thank Representative Sonny for having us here in the beautiful areas of Erie. And um, thank you for the township building for being gracious enough to host us here and let us use your facility. I also want to thank our audiovisual crew who does a great job. This is being streamed live for members who cannot be physically here, so they are able to be watching this in their legislative districts. It will also be available on PCN later uh, for future viewing. And last but not least, our committee as a policy committee will be reviewing all these tapes from the different hearings and putting together legislative package from some of the suggestions by testifiers like yourself today. Uh, to our panel, feel comfortable, relaxed. Uh, we're here to learn from you, and we are encouraged by your discussion. Before that, I want to turn the microphone over to our host, Representative Sunny. Thanks again, Kurt, for having us. Thank you, Chairman Benninghoff, for bringing the policy committee to Harbor Creek. Um, it's not too often that we get Harrisburg to come to Harbor Creek, so it uh, absolutely is always a delight. Um, I'd like to welcome the, the other members that are here this morning. I think it's going to be an interesting and lively conversation, and um, I'm really looking forward to hearing what our testifiers have to say this morning. Uh, I'd like to also thank the Harbor Creek Township for the use of their facility today, and um, I hope everybody has their phones on silent, and um, I'm ready. Let's begin. Thank you. I forgot that little thing. Our panelists will be Richard Novotny from the Erie County Development Authority, Jake Roosh, Roosh, I apologize if I butcher any of the names, the Erie Regional Chamber and Growth Partnership, as well as Colleen Jennings and Mike Kowalski. Thank you. Uh, for Career Concept Staffing. Uh, thank you very much. I historically will go ladies to men, so if you're comfortable with that, otherwise we can just go from your left to the right, whatever works for you. Uh, good. Chivalry is not dead. Thank you very much. Take your time, share your comments, and we will wait and have the members ask questions after all four panelists are done. Excuse me one second before I do that. Uh, one housekeeping item, I generally like the members to introduce themselves just from where they're at so you get an idea of the representation here at the panel. Uh, Park Wedling State Representative in the 17th Legislative District. I'm honored to serve uh, portions of Lawrence, Mercer, Crawford, and Erie Counties. Thank you. Good morning, Donna Oberlander. I represent the 63rd District, which includes all of Clarion, parts of Armstrong, and parts of Forest County. Good morning, uh, Representative Marty Causer. I represent McKean, Potter, and Cameron Counties. Good morning again, Kurt Sunny. This is my district, which is the fourth legislative district in Eastern Erie County. Representative Kerry Benninghoff, I represent parts of Center County, about 220 miles east here, and parts of Lewistown and the uh, Mifflin County. Good morning, uh, Representative Kathy Rapp. I represent the 65th district of all of Warren County, part of Forest, and part of Crawford County. Good morning, Representative Brad Roy. I represent parts of Western Erie County and most of Central Crawford County. Thank you. With that, Colleen, if you'd like to start us off, I appreciate it. Okay. You let me know if I'm screaming. Okay. My name is Colleen Jennings. I'm the Operations Manager and the Controller for Career Concept Staffing Services. I've been with the company for seven years. My colleague, Mike Kofsky, has been with the company for 19 years. He's our head staffing manager, so he deals with people every day, day in and day out. Uh, we were founded in 1967. We came under new ownership in 2010. We are a full-service employment agency with eight branch offices, seven in, North, in Pennsylvania and one in New York State. We have been voted uh, the best staffing firm by the Erie Times Reader's Poll for more than 10 years. We're ranked 43 on the Pennsylvania Department of Labor and Industry's top 50 employers list. And our industry is ranked number 13 on, that same, on the um, industries list, top 50 industries list. In 2016, we had over 2,600 employees. 
For 2017, uh, we have experienced a 15% increase, and we will, by the end of the year, we expect to have probably around 3,200. Uh, we have served over 280 clients so far in 2017. We're on track to hit over $14 million in sales for 2017. And that's a little, just a little bit of our history. And um, now maybe we can talk about jobs and how the PA can help us stay in business for another 50 years. Yeah. Um, we, there are jobs. We feel there are jobs out there. Um, we have more jobs than we can, we have people. We have clients that are turning machine, or shutting machines down on a daily, weekly basis because we just, they don't have bodies to fill them. Uh, we offer, they decline, or we offer, they say, yeah, I'll show up for work, and then they don't show up for work. Um, many of our applicants just want to, they have to prove to gov other government agencies that they are looking for work. Looking for work and finding work, I think, are two different things for them. You know, there are jobs out there, but they just, for one reason or another, don't, you know, they know the system. You know, they really do know the system. Um, Mike could probably attest more to the to the day to day. Um, we have clients that will are willing to train employees. Um, they will just just find me a body, bring it, get them in here. We'll we'll train them. And I mean, we've had clients that have increased their their rates, you know, pay rates just to entice employees. But um, they come to us, and you know, what what can we do? You know, sometimes it helps, sometimes it doesn't. You know, we can, we can raise the pay rate a little bit, but um, it, just, it just doesn't seem to be working. Uh, we spend a lot, of, one of our um, major expenses is advertising. We spend thousands and thousands of dollars every year on advertising. You know, Indeed, I mean, newspapers, I mean, you know, now it's all social media. We spend a, a lot of time and a lot of money just on that and just to attract new new applicants and I mean we do get some in obviously we put 3,200 people to work this year so we're doing something right but I mean if you could see the numbers of people that come through our doors that you know it's astonishing so I don't know if you have, I don't know if you have anything else to add Mike but um. She pretty much hit it. I mean, we get 14, probably 14 to 25 applicants a day. Half of them won't even accept a job. Um, probably half of those go home, think about it, don't ever call you. If they do accept a job, you know, 50% of them don't show up the first day. It's just terrible. I've never seen it like this. I've been there 19 years, and it's, we got every company in Erie yelling, screaming for people. So, and like she said, most of them this year even went up a buck, two bucks. I mean, they're not minimum wage jobs no more. I mean, they're decent paying, they'll train you, and you can move up, but there's, they choose not to work. And then when, you know, they'll go to work for a few days and then no show on you, and the next thing they're doing is bringing in a welfare paper. Can you send that, this down to the welfare office? Happens five, 10 times a day, I'll bet. Yeah, we do a little. But that's all I have. I should add that we do win our, we do, we have a lot of unemployment paperwork that we do. And we win most of our, I mean, a good percentage of our cases because we, we have a process where people have to check in and we can prove that, hey, they didn't check in. You know, they're supposed to check in once a week. They don't. So we win most of our unemployment cases. Unfortunately, that doesn't help us help our clients. You know, I mean, so, and then you get the people calling you screaming, hey, why'd you, why'd you tell them I didn't go show up for work? Well, you didn't show up for work. <laughs> well, my kid was sick or, you know, I, I mean, I'm, I'm, I'm a, I have a family of my own. I, I get it. I mean, I get the kid thing. I get the, you know, but, you know, there's got to be a backup plan, you know. It's just poor planning, I think. But that's all I had. Thank you. Jake or Richard? Okay. Okay. Um, good morning. My name's Rick Novotny. Uh, welcome to Erie County. 
Welcome back, Kurt. Um, a little history or background of myself. I've been in business uh, back in the 80s in the restaurant business, owned and operated a restaurant, uh, got involved in economic development in 1987, so I've got about 30 years in this business. Uh, originally working for a regional planning and development corporation, uh, moved to a small town of 6,000 people, 7,000 people, uh, started an economic development program there. Um, and currently I'm the executive director of nine different uh, entities, ranging from uh, government authorities like redevelopment authorities, general authorities, um, to 501c3 nonprofits, to um, 501c6 uh, certified economic development corporations. Um, so we manage most of the real estate projects and finance projects in Erie County. Um, so with that background of 30 years, I've watched the state do a lot of things in economic development. Um, and frankly, we're scared right now because uh, budget cuts since the, um, well, since in the past eight years actually have weakened economic development. I believe the, um, the budget, total budget for the state of Pennsylvania is equal to the budget of Houston, is it? <laughs> One city in Texas? Um, so we, we really have no tools. That's the biggest problem. Actually, the biggest problem is workforce, but after that comes the tools we need for economic development. A couple of things you, the state did well was consolidating all the programs like PETA, MELF, SBF, all the acronyms into one central gateway, um, and that works. Um, things take a little bit longer, but we get it. Um, the programs that probably shouldn't have been killed um, or at least severely weakened uh, are programs like the Enterprise Zone program. Uh, back in the 90s, the city of Cory um, adopted an Enterprise Zone program, um, and the concept of Enterprise Zone is to allow communities to build assets so that they can basically, you know, teach a guy to fish, and, you know, he can fish for himself, give a guy a fish, and he's hungry the next day. Um, so this, this Enterprise Zone program allowed the city of Cory to build an $8 million revolving loan fund. That has grown to over $16 million in assets right now. Um, and because of that, we currently own 700,000 square feet of space, which is available to industrial tenants. Um, we, we can lend to our, our, our manufacturers and businesses in the community without having to go to the state in many cases. Um, so we've been doing that fairly successfully uh, for the past 20 some years. Um, in the early 2000s, the, uh, the city of Erie, or the county of Erie uh, wanted to replicate that program throughout the county. Um, the, the county came up with an $8 million grant and said, Novotny, go to Harrisburg and see if you can get the, encount the entire county set up as an enterprise zone, which we did. Um, this was the first uh, countywide enterprise zone in the state, um, but having that match allowed DCED at the time to say, okay, you know, we understand what you're doing, you were successful here, let's try it there. Um, and, and in doing so, we built that program, the County Revolving Loan Fund, to over $16 million. So we, we do have some resources. A lot of them, not a lot of them, all of them are on the street. So there may be a million or two dollars that we have available at any one time to do the next project. Um, so the, the program, the Enterprise Zone program, back in the day was a great program. I mean, it allowed you know, places like the county, uh, city of Cory, other municipalities throughout the state to build cap local capacity, um, but lately I think it's I think it's pretty well gutted. I mean, there might be uh, it might be a couple million dollar program. Uh, they do allow new enterprise zone communities in, but there really is no funding in the competitive grant program, which um, was a was a tool whereby if a company had a project, they could come out to, you know, to the enterprise zone coordinator. We would write a grant application to the state. The state would fund that grant. Um, we would lend the money to the uh, company and the terms of the grant are once they paid you back, go lend it out to more companies. And that's what we did. Um, I think, ooh, my, like off the top of my head, I think we've lent out over 
$85 million and revolved it and revolved it. So those are, I mean, those are, those are some really good programs. Um, a program that went away was the infrastructure development program. Uh, that was a grant program that's been replaced by um, PennVest. Uh, the, the grant program w was good because it would allow you to run you know, infrastructure out, water, sewer, build industrial parks. Uh, PennVest is a loan program in many cases, and assets like water, sewer lines, you know, roads, you can't pay them back. How do you pay them back? I mean, it's other than, you know, this, the municipality, you know, charging their water rates and fees uh, for sewage. But, you know, if, in an industrial setting, they look at, you know, us as the economic development team to build the pay place out for them, and then they assume control of the, the road, water, and, and sewer system. So without those kind of grants, and, and grants also to, to build out vacant industrial blighted properties to take down what's not necessary and to rehabilitate and redevelop properties that exist so that you could create, take that old space, turn it into newer space, place companies in there, um, and create jobs by putting them in there. The, um, another program that is on the verge, I, I feel, of extinction is a, is a great program to uh, re reutilize brownfields. It's called the Industrial Site Reuse Program. That program has traditionally been funded by corporate stock and franchise taxes. Uh, those are being cut and, and phased out, and there needs to be a replacement for that um, because this program, which is a DCED program that, that locks arms with DEP and the local economic development people, um, helps us go out, buy environmentally challenged properties, uh, take those properties, get them cleaned up, get them to one of the three uh, standards for uh, cleanliness, whether it's industrial site-specific, site um, health and safety standard, or uh, whatever that third standard is. But um, so you, once you do that, now you have a clean certification from the state, from DEP that says, hey, the next company that moves in here, they don't have to worry about the, the tragedies of you know the last year or last century. Um, so that program really needs to find a fix to, for, for the funding because if it goes away, we're going to be faced with a lot of brownfields that can't get redeveloped. And, and then w what that does is it forces businesses to go out and develop into greenfields, which just spreads, you know, uh, burns up all your greenfields that you have out there instead of using something that already has water and infrastructure and, and utilities to it. Um, so that, that's, that's something you, you need to find a fix for before it goes, um, goes away. Uh, programs like the Redevelopment Assistance Capital Program are, are great programs in that they provide 50-50 grant to you know, local communities for fairly sizable projects ranging from a you know, million to 50 million and, and beyond. Um, that program, you know, we do need, at least in Erie County, uh, some help with getting some projects funded. I know, you know, as, as legislators, your role is basically to put it into legislation. Um, and to get it out, it's a governor uh, writing, uh, signing off on the grant so that it can be implemented in the communities. Um, on the real estate front, um, the a reopening of some type of a KOZ type initiative, um, is, is it probably a, it's, it's maybe time to come again. I know there was a recent opening that said if you had a KOZ property and nothing developed on it, then you can add a few more years to it. But it might, it might make sense to take another look, um, kind of wipe the slate clean and say, okay, let's take a look, a look at all the properties that are out there and what can we do to um, stimulate uh, job growth in those, on those sites. Um, what else do we have here? Um, on, the lab on the labor front, um, it's interesting in Erie County, uh, we have a, a lot of refugees from Miramar and uh, Niger, Nepal, I mean, all, all over the place. Uh, we have, there's a refugee community and we, um, we bring in several thousand a year. Um, and they all find jobs, they all wanna work. And it, it, it's just really interesting. Um, they will live in the city and take a bus to Girard, which is about 40 miles away, uh, work in a donut factory. 
um, and the, they, they, they're well represented there. Uh, maybe they don't speak the language, so there's one or two of them that are on the shift that kind of translate for, for everyone. Um, but I was, I was actually talking to, to a uh, person at the U.S. Uh, House, and the comment I got was kind of startling, and that is that, you know, as these refugees start, you know, start here and they're working, um, eventually they look around the neighborhood and they see the guy next door who doesn't work and, you know, has a, has a life as probably better than they have, um, and they're out there, you know, working every day, you know, doing what they think is right, but, you know, are shown that all you have to do is sign up for, you know, uh, unemployment or welfare or whatever, and you pretty much can um, you know, live that, that life without having to work. Um, so, you know, that, that's kind of discouraging. I don't know how much that happens in the refugee community. I hope not too much, because I think they look at, you know, an opportunity of coming to America as an opportunity to uh, better themselves, uh, to not only get out of the, you know, camps or whatever they lived in, but, you know, to be able to become successful. Uh, so, if, you know, working with those communities, I think, may have some merit. Um, you know, it, it, there's been discussion back and forth for years, I think, of uh, welfare-to-work kind of programs, where if um, if you're on any type of assistance and you can work, I mean, uh, we're not talking about people that are, you know, physically disabled or mentally challenged or you know, 70 years old or, or even 60 like me. Uh, but anyways, you, you know, if, if you're getting a, 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 some assistance, then there should be some requirement to volunteer X amount of time to either your local government, county government, a nonprofit, you know, some, do some work, do something, <laughs> whether it's pick up paper or anything, but, you know, some program that says, okay, you know, you're getting this check, we understand, you know, why you're getting the check, but, you know, you probably have a lot of time on your hands, so spend 10 hours a week doing something uh, good for the community. Um, so I think that's kind of where I'm at right now. I'd, I'd like, you know, once Jake's done, to really have an open discussion with you, and uh, you can ask questions, and, and uh, we talk about different issues that we're, cha we're challenged with right now. Um, you may or may not know, in Erie County, there was a recent, well, about a year and a half ago, um, filing, uh, bankruptcy filing of our lead economic development team. So we're kind of in the rebuilding stage right now. Uh, we're trying to acquire some, some real estate because, I mean, we're like a store with nothing on the shelf. I, I have really no land to sell or no build. All the buildings we have are fully occupied. We do have some loan money available, but again, it's, you know, most of it's out in the street, so it gets to be a little bit challenging. Jake? Good morning. Um, I um, promised to have you out of here just before Christmas break. Um, <laughs> I uh, started my economic development career. I work for the Erie Regional Chamber and Growth Partnership. We're a regional chamber of commerce with over 800 members. I think um, that um, I will be as straightforward and candid with you as possible. I know a lot of your colleagues in the counties that you serve in doing economic development. I'm very familiar with the region. Um, I started in economic development in Erie County in 1991, so over 25 years ago. I then moved and ran economic development in a chamber of commerce in Dubois, Pennsylvania. Came back to Erie to run a CEO organization called the Erie Conference that merged and created the Erie Regional Chamber in 2002. Uh, in 25 years, I've seen a dramatic shift between the role and the function of the state of Pennsylvania in economic development and the federal government and where we sit today. And uh, what I would suggest to you all is to open your eyes wide and accept the fact that Pennsylvania is going into the game of economic development with a pop gun and everyone else has nuclear weapons. Um, in all candor, Pennsylvania has no shot of competing for significant projects other than outside major corridors such as the Pittsburgh market, the Philadelphia market, and the surrounding southeastern part of the state. Um, and that is, a, that is a result of so many variables, and I just want to touch on a few. But I will just tell you that Rick and I travel the country and go to conferences and talk with our colleagues in both economic development agencies and chambers of commerce, 
And uh, we've really kind of gone backwards as a commonwealth from where we were. We were a leader, now we're a significant follower, uh, and we are, um, we are at a competitive disadvantage from the standpoint of attracting companies here and retaining those that are here. So um, this is a great opportunity for us to just share with you candidly. This is, I will tell you point blank, no offense to any of you, but I'm not a fan of the Republican or Democratic parties because uh, I live in a nonpartisan world. It's either a good idea or it's not. So anything I talk to you about is not driven by a political agenda on my part. Our organization's agnostic that way. Uh, we're really gonna just talk to you very candidly about things that matter. The first one is, and something that the Commonwealth used to play a role in and is starting to play a role again in something you funded called the Engage program, and that is proactive business outreach to your existing base of employers. I know your counties. The most important economic development initiative you can take in your counties is to talk to your existing employers and do everything you can to help them stay there, grow there, and become more competitive. In economic development, that's the most effective and efficient spend of any dollar, which is helping an existing company grow and expand where they are already. The facts are the facts. 85% of job growth in nearly any economy come from your existing base growing. The rest of it comes from entrepreneurship and business attraction. There's a perception that 80% of your job growth comes from outside investment coming in, and that's not just untrue. Um, it is maybe true 15% of your job growth comes in bigger markets like Austin, Texas, or Portland, Oregon from outside investors. In Erie County and in the counties that you serve, I would say new job growth from existing employers is in the tune of 98%. The rest of it probably comes from entrepreneurs starting up new businesses, and then a small fraction comes from new attraction. So we have been running the best and most significant, or one of the top three best and most significant business outreach programs for the last 15 years at the regional chamber. Um, we have consistently met with 200 businesses proactively to connect them to the economic development system. Businesses don't have time. When you're running a shop, you don't have time to figure out what tools are out there. And frankly, it's an inefficient use of their time to try and figure out what tools will help them grow and expand their business. Our team goes out, sits down, thanks them for being in business, tours their plant, finds out how they make money, and then says, what's keeping you up at night? Based upon what we hear them say, we then connect them up to the programs that can help them grow and expand their business. Those programs could be offered through the state, they could be a revolving loan fund. They could be, in fact, uh, in many cases they are, just connecting them up to a private sector interest, a special interest uh, engineer, accountant, uh, attorney, uh, a marketing person. Could be contacting a municipal building to help iron out an issue. Bottom line is, is that building that relationship is critical to help address their needs. They don't have time to leave the operation to go find the person, wade through it. That's what we do. With the support of the state through a special uh, DCED uh, partnership with the Department of Defense, uh, we secured a grant and we're doing outreach to defense contractors in Crawford County, Erie County, and Warren County. And uh, that's a targeted hit list to make sure that they're broadening their scope of markets, not just in defense. Um, that enabled us to add another full-time person, so in 2000, this year, we'll do upwards of 350 face-to-face -face visits with companies. Um, Engage, which is a funded program that you put forward, uh, will enable Northwest Pennsylvania to finally get dollars to dedicate teams to go out and meet with more companies. So all of your counties are part of a regional application we're putting in through the Northwest Commission. And again, next year, I think we'll be upwards of four to 500 businesses. Now, just to give you an idea, in Erie County, there's probably 4,000 businesses that employ someone. Uh, not just fictitious names or uh, entities on paper, but actual employers. So, while it's a significant number, it's, it's clearly not everyone. Um, and so, we start there. The second thing we do in Erie County is we coordinate our economic development assistance in a, through something called the Lead Economic Development Team. Rick and our colleagues from the city, from the county, from the Governor's Action Team, DCED, Ben Franklin, Small Business Development Centers, Industrial Resource Centers, Workforce Development Board, we get together twice a month and talk about what's going right and wrong in the village. 
what we need to do to help service customers at a higher level. It keeps us from wasting resources and leveraging each other's contacts, keeps us in touch so that we are, in fact, a unified, coordinated system. That's unique. I don't know of any other county that meets with that regularity. Uh, it gives us a competitive advantage. It costs us nothing other than the chamber spending the time to say, we'll facilitate this, host the meeting, get together. The agenda takes care of itself. Um, so th those elemental things and some of the things that Rick talked about, we've created some solutions here in Erie County that I know don't exist in other counties. Rick talked about the Cory Redevelopment Fund, uh, which is in the tune of how much? 16 million now? Or 8 million? Uh, 8 million. 8 million in quarry, 16 million through the County Redevelopment Authority, and then the City of Erie Enterprise Zone has doubled in the last few years. Those three funds are m millions of dollars out on the street helping companies of all different sizes grow and expand, machinery, equipment, loan funds, expansions of buildings, et cetera. The default rate on those is 1%. Less than 1%. Less than 1%. We are, we, are, we are taking money and revolving it. So when that interest gets paid back, that fund grows and we have a local tool that we can use that candidly is not available by any stretch of the imagination to a lot of the counties you serve, but in many cases, not at all in certain counties. So we're a big fan of uh, having tools that we can keep and we can grow so we can use them in perpetuity to help companies grow and expand here. Um, some big picture things that you need to take into consideration, not only is the funding from the state level, but in your counties, I know for a fact that Economic Development Administration funding and Appalachian Regional Commission funding in the past helped build industrial parks and facilities that are, you're still benefiting from today. Those funds have been cut rather dramatically at the federal level. That was good old fashioned grant funds coming in in pretty sizable chunks that to any county, and Erie County was a great beneficiary of them. Uh, make a huge difference in developing infrastructure. Um, and we face some federal hurdles to see what happens with new market tax credits, historic preservation tax credits. Um, so th the landscape is very complex, it's very diverse, but let's boil it down to some very simple things and I'll bring it to Pennsylvania and what, what I think some things that you're at should consider going forward. Um, in business attraction or in business expansion, uh, it's driven, businesses are driven by a very basic question and that question is, do you have what I need? If you don't have what they need, they move on down the road. It has nothing to do with um, them liking you or not liking you. It's a real simple question. And a lot of times that question is driven by, do you have the land that I need? Do you have the building that I need? Do you have the workforce that I need? And if you can't answer those basic questions right out of the gate, you're out. And they move on down the road and look for the place that can answer those. So before you get to the quality of life brochures and before you get to talking in depth, there's some very basic filter questions. So economic development and a lot of the stuff that I would suggest you should look at from a strategic standpoint are what can you do to build assets in Pennsylvania? that cannot be hooked to a tractor trailer and taken down the road. 20 years ago, 25 years ago, in, or 20 years ago in uh, the Ridge administration, there was a big uproar about a 10-year tax break given to Bush Industries to build a facility that you can see from I-90. It's a million 100,000 square feet facility under roof. The uproar was that we gave a tax break uh, on the property taxes for 10 years to that facility. A million 100,000 square foot facility um, got a tax break for 10 years. It employed people, never hit the projections that it wanted to. But at the end of 10 years, it didn't matter if Bush Industries owned that facility or a private equity group, they were gonna pay taxes on that. So we delayed gratification, we built an asset up there, and that million 100,000 square foot facility was subsequently bought by Lord Corporation, one of our most important employers, who invested $100 million into that facility. Do you think Lord Corporation's gonna unplug and move out of Pennsylvania now after that investment? A strategic location to retain a company and grow a company? Absolutely not. That tax break enabled us to secure an asset that will be with us for decades. So as we look at Pennsylvania, what kind of assets can we put out there 
that can't be taken away, that are great investments for the Commonwealth and great investments for every county. Industrial parks and facilities are great investments that can't go away. Now, driving that comes down to Pennsylvania for the last eight, 12, perhaps longer, has not had any form of an economic development strategy. And this is where I'll get into my Republican and Democrat side. I have no idea what Tom Corbett's strategy was. Saying energy is the strategy is not the strategy. I don't know what Governor Wolf's strategy is. I don't know what the target sectors are. I don't know what the strategic investments are to address and c compete in those targeted markets that you're going after. The last 10, 12 years or so, what we've seen is a cut strategy, a funding cut strategy. Well, all businesses are looking to maintain costs, but concurrent with their cut costs cutting, they are also equally looking to make strategic investments to grow the business. Pennsylvania has been void of any strategy to grow the business of Pennsylvania. And this isn't an easy thing to figure out. And candidly, um, for all the members in the House and the Senate, there's probably that many different opinions times two about how we go about doing that. And one thought to, to, to depoliticize that is two states that you should look at going back in time, Governor Keating when he was in Oklahoma and Governor Manchin when he was in West Virginia, each employed in Oklahoma, they got Oklahoma State and University of Oklahoma, and they assembled a team of their demographers, their economists, their legal experts, all their professionals, and mapped out a strategy of what do we need to do to change and make Oklahoma more competitive. That drove the agenda of their legislature and the governor's office. So if you end up with 20 things, you could now are debating off of which of the 20 should we attack first versus having a new 20 every year. Down in West Virginia, Moody's was brought in by Manchin, saying, what do we need to do to, com to make the, the, the financial rating of West Virginia more powerful? And they said, here are the things you have to address. And it got into workers' comp rates. It got into unemployment compensation patterns and how they're handling that. Pennsylvania needs that level of strategy. Pennsylvania has some of the most brilliant minds in the world that could be assembled together and driven in, a, in an unbiased, nonpartisan approach to figure out and develop that action plan for the next 20 years of things that we need to address. Then, as a legislature, you're going to have the debate off of a preset list versus an anecdotal idea that comes to the table that may or may not have a significant impact across the, the entire of Commonwealth. You've got to fund economic development um, clearly and, and understand where you are. The city of Austin, Texas is what Rick was talking about. The city of Austin, Texas economic development budget is $42 million. The entire budget for the Commonwealth of Pennsylvania in community and economic development is, I believe, $158 million. Um, you can't compete. You can't compete when you have that level of competition out there. And I understand money is tight. But if you want jobs and you want to compete as a commonwealth, then you have to make priorities and you have to make hard decisions. You can decide where those cuts could be, but I'm telling you that, that the, the reason that Pennsylvania has survived and, and kept it where it is is because the magnet of, north, of southeastern Pennsylvania, its warehousing distribution assets right around where all of you work in the Harrisburg area, moving down into Philly, they have gotten significant investment in that area solely by geography and people not wanting to be in Jersey and New York City. And that is what has led to a number of significant investments there. Pittsburgh's just done a fabulous job of reinventing itself. But I would put that solely, or not solely, but very much on the shoulders of the Pittsburgh community and the institutions that they have there in Carnegie Mellon, UPMC, University of Pittsburgh, um, U.S. Steel, Alcoa, others that have made a commitment to really make that a competitive environment. Um, the, um, the last piece of this, and again, we could talk about others, is Rick talked about Keystone Opportunity Zones. What I will tell you is when we talk about businesses, asking the question of do you have what I need, part of what they want is they want pad-ready, pre-permitted sites with all of the water, sewer, electric, and gas in those sites, 
ready to go. So when they say, you know what, I love this location, I needed 100 acres, you have 100 acres, and I know that in 90 days, I can get my firm in there, we can start breaking ground if I choose you. That is a very doable thing for every county in Pennsylvania. You can set up the guidelines, you can set up the specs by which you would qualify, then it's up to the county. You have to assemble the property, it's gotta be under single ownership whether it's through the county or through an industrial development authority. You have to make the investment in the water, sewer, and uh, natural gas and electric in partnership with your utilities or as a county investment. Um, and then the Commonwealth, frankly, needs to take those super sites or those pre-identified sites and start prioritizing them to shop them in front of prospects that they have meeting with them. I think then you're going to start to get the spread of economic development projects around the Commonwealth, and everybody has a vested interest in the game. And candidly, your colleague, my, our colleagues in economic development in your counties have something real that they can put on the table for every prospect that comes in. So um, I'll stop there because there's significant other stuff I could go into, but I'd rather answer the questions that matter the most to you. Well, thank you, all four of you. Your community is very uh, blessed to have your insight and your services. Uh, we do have some questions, and if there's something that we do not ask and you have further detail, I'd like to hear that because we are truly here on a mission to learn. Uh, we don't consider ourselves experts, but we do realize we're in some capacity to facilitate some of these items. Our first question comes from Representative Rapp. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, and, and thank you for being here. This is um, uh, very informative. Um, I've been in uh, many meetings with uh, local businesses uh, uh, in the 65th district. I also serve on the education committee. So when I, and I'm assuming uh, Colleen and Mike, when you talk about um, the jobs, are you talking about jobs uh, for, uh, that are, the qualifications are a high school diploma or GED and you still can't fill those jobs? So both. Both, yeah, both. professional and light industrial. Right, and I, I know that is a big problem in uh, the legislative district that I serve, is it's not just the decline in population, it is people who would prefer to collect uh, benefits instead of actually going into the workforce. And we did look at uh, welfare reform, which uh, our governor has uh, chosen to, to veto. Uh, and one of the reasons he did was because of the, the um, uh, work requirement. Um, but serving on the education committee, and we're always looking and, and doing hearings, and we are seeing uh, the pendulum move now towards um, uh, are students going on to uh, jobs that would involve technology and more the two-year programs because that's where the jobs are instead of the four-year. Although we still have a lot of students going in that direction and that's wonderful, you know, if the students uh, are, are going to go to a, a four-year degree where they can actually walk into a job uh, that is open where they need that kind of uh, requirement. And also knowing that uh, Erie City just received a large amount of money, um, maybe not in your eyes compared to you know cities in Texas, but for the legislators in Pennsylvania, there was a substantial amount of money that is going to the city of Erie. So my question, and um, yeah, the school district of Erie, are you all working with the uh, educational system to educate students on the need to be able to graduate from school and get a job and be a contributing citizen um, <clears throat> for you know your your county and for your city, it's it's wonderful and I absolutely agree with all the workforce development. Um, I know the businesses in, uh, as I live in Warren County, so I'll use them for an example. Our established family businesses really are the heart, you know, and what keeps the, the economic engine driving in, in the district. 
but we do see a decline in population. So when we're looking at economic development and businesses relocating, they see that decline in population, uh, that old people don't want to go to work, you know, the jobs are there, uh, but they still can't fill those jobs. So how are you working with the educational system to try to emphasize to students and school districts um, and businesses that that's where we need to start to grow the economy in Northwestern Pennsylvania and for people to stay here and get a job here in Northwest PA? Well, I can say that um, we do a lot of career fairs. We try to hit a lot of the schools. Um, we, I guess our biggest one is, is career fairs. You get a lot of people. You get, I mean, it's a lot of out of school. I mean, there, unfortunately, there's a lot of people that can't afford to, a higher education. You know, I mean, that's just the world we live in. I mean, it just happens. Most of our applicants, don't have a college education. Most of them didn't, some of them couldn't, maybe didn't finish high school. But that's, unfortunately, that's who lives here, you know? So, unfortunately, we, yeah, I have to say, we really don't, you know, other than that, we really don't go into education. I mean, we just don't do it. Okay, um, in, in Warren County, uh, the Career and Technical <laughs> School has an advisory board Made up of made up of the business community. The com business community is active on that advisory, and you know they'll take students uh, into their businesses for sh job shadowing. And I'm assuming that you do that here in Erie County. But I I'm a big believer that uh, a lot of these issues do start within the educational system and training our young people and getting them to career um, uh, career days and but is is there a vested interest in Erie and I'm, I, I know there is I guess I just need to hear that yeah. you're you're saying that you're going to be reaching down into uh, my eighth grade on up to make sure yeah, I know there's barriers in, in literacy and in financial, but those same students need to know that a path can be created for them to go on to a technical school. Certainly there's technical schools here in this county, and maybe those students need a way, they need to know that there's a path for them to get there. So let, let's, um, let me hit on a, um, the issue of the business community and, and as a community, absolutely, there is a recognition of what you just outlined. Um, and there are uh, several initiatives that I won't get into the nitty gritty detail, but um, we have an initiative that was, we, first of all, we have, um, we, we embrace through our Manufacturers and Business Association Manufacturing Day and have a few thousand students come through one day to get oriented to manufacturing. And that's paired with, an ongoing year-long initiative or ongoing initiative called Career Street where employers bring those students that you're talking about in to tour businesses of all different types to see careers and get a feel for what's going on in the community and again thousands of students touch that way we have a, a group of manufacturing employers who are very focused about creating the structured pipeline for future workers and marketing careers and manufacturing that's the Erie Regional Manufacturing Partnership uh, we have an anti-poverty initiative that is one of the, uh, called Erie Together, and one of the arms of that is about getting people connected to the jobs that exist here presently. Out of that, there's a re-entry program for, for offenders that uh, we are trying to get them connected to. So there is a significant number of initiatives, and all of those initiatives involve our, our at the center, are gonna be our, our technical school, our Erie County Technical School, going to be the school districts, going to be the tech schools within the, the vocational schools within those school districts, as well as uh, Gannon University and, and the other colleges. They have a Go College initiative to get kids connected in the grade school and high school level into college initiatives. So there's a, there's a dramatic recognition up here about the importance of working to change the culture to get people into employable, uh, into employment and into careers. Um, I think that 
there's, and again, people will talk about it starts at the home and we've got to change the way people parent. And I, I think I would like to take a little different angle on that. And that is, um, years ago, I was very impacted by just an informal discussion about the size of the room with Tom Ridge. And they asked him when he was Homeland Security, um, how do you manage such a big operation? He said, I grew up with a father who worked multiple jobs and it, he always made an impression on me that all work is honorable. So it doesn't matter if you're the baggage handler or waitress or whatever it is, you always respect people because of the fact that they're working. And as a culture, as a society, I think we'd have more success instead of trying to change people's parenting styles to get people to recognize that working is an honorable thing and it's part of who we are as a, uh, as a country and as a commonwealth. And uh, we need to just focus on when someone's working, affirm the fact that work is an honorable thing to do, and it's the right thing to do, uh, without getting into anything other than that, and really match that with these exposures to careers. Um, the other piece of this, and this is a sociological issue, I think the challenge is, when you travel the country, you'll run into places where it's about making money, not having a career. And that sounds really uh, heretical up here, you know, that you can't say that. Uh, but the fact is, is that you need to make money to survive in life. How do you make that money? And so if you travel to some of the most dynamic places in the country, you'll run into people that have three or four different things. So they will be a, a realtor. They will be a caddy at a country club. They'll work at a manufacturing operation. They'll have their own side gig. They might drive Uber or they'll do other things. I'm not suggesting that's for everyone, but those people know hey, you got to get out there and you got to make, you got to make money to survive. And, and so I, I think we, 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 we face, we have to face the reality that we've kind of lost our work ethic in general, and we've got to get it back. Part of that is wages to what they're saying, 100% agree. A lot of people staying at home, sitting at home, they're not going to get prompted to, to really move out until they get to a number that makes sense for them. But the longer they're out of the workforce, the less valuable they become and the harder it is to pay them a competitive wage. Thank you. I appreciate your comments. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you. I'm going to take a minute to just reiterate today is about having good, candid dialogue, and I, I appreciate your willingness to do this. Uh, I just want to reiterate your concept about people taking pride in going to work. People laugh at me sometimes, but I tell them I still have my very first pay stub from actually going to an employer. I had done a lot of lawn work for a physician's wife. But I was 16 or 17, but I remember I made just shy of $90 for 40 hours of construction work. But I look at that every day, well not every day, but every time I go through that drawer, but it's a good reminder. But more importantly, I think it is about the honor of coming here. And I see that with people who come from other countries and they open up different businesses and they're working 12, 14 hours a day. They're proud to be there, they're honorable, they have their children and they're helping them sometimes. It's really something to emulate. One quick question for Colleen and Mike. What are the starting wages on average that you're offering to people that are just generally denying it? And more importantly, I'm curious how much time you think you're spending processing paperwork for welfare for people who just want to go through the motions of telling the welfare departments, yeah, I tried to get a job, I couldn't get one, it wasn't what I like or what I could do. Most of the general labor jobs are between 9 and 11, 9 and $12 an hour. And there's overtime available. As far as percentage of your time you think you're spending having to process paperwork versus trying mm -hmm. to get people jobs? Well, we invested in an all-digital system. Uh, we started it in January of 16, and it's, we like it. Um, it, it we, we made it easy for people. I mean, you can, you can apply. You can pull out your cell phone and apply for a job for us right now. Pull it out. I mean, everything's web-based, mobile-based. I mean, we're, we're, we're really trying to make it easy for you. I mean, we're making it so you don't have to get off the couch to come see us and, you know. And so we're, we're really, we've invested a lot of time and money in doing that. Um, it's a good amount of time. Um, right now, I actually have a girl that's my HR manager that's on maternity leave and I, to, to fill her position, I have three part-time people filling out paperwork. That's unemployment, that's um, unemployment, and that's welfare. But none of that is getting people into work. It's answering right. questions so they can say, I tried to get a job. Right, exactly. Very frustrating. 
Uh, other members have questions. I'll go back to that a little bit later. Representative Oberlander, followed up by Representative Chairman Causer. Thank you, Chairman, and thank you for your testimony. Uh, I have a couple of questions for a couple of different members on the panel, but I'll start with uh, Mr. Rausch. I appreciate your comments regarding the outreach program. Uh, Fifteen or so years ago, I actually served as the business outreach manager for Clarion County Economic Development and know what a valuable program it is and how we need to connect with our businesses so that they know what is available. But in these hearings and the, uh, the uh, discussions that I have with our businesses, more and more often, it's more about we want government out of our way and the regulations are strangling us. And you mentioned something in your comments about a permitted pad and that they want to have a permitted pad and that's something that every community could have. Well, my understanding of the permits, and I would love to hear your, your thoughts on this, is that number one, you can't get a permit to save your life. It takes almost a year if you're, if you're fortunate enough to get it that quickly and that it expires in a year. So how does that community continue to hold that permit ready for that potential business? You're not gonna be able, it, it is all driven by the nature of the business, number one. So if you have a very heavy industri in, uh, industrial user who's gonna be emitting affluent into the air, uh, clearly there's a permit, you can't, pre you can't just say you got a blanket permit for the site, but ready from the standpoint of the local level, ready to go on the permitting side at the state level, however, there's nothing to keep the Commonwealth from setting up definitive timelines that from the moment you submit your paperwork in 90 days, you will either get your permit, you will have an answer, you know, and if you don't get that answer, you will have your permit. That has been done in the past. Jim Seif, who is Secretary of DEP under Ridge, was very adamant about that, that it was a matter of the, 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 the paperwork had to be in, once the paperwork was in, you were going to have an answer in a defined period of time. And the former CEO of GE Transportation up here made a very insightful comment that I think everybody should understand from a state government standpoint. He met with Seif, and Seif told him the CEO was Dave Calhoun. Dave Calhoun is now chairman of the board at Caterpillar. He was the former CEO of the Nielsen Company after he left here. And Dave Calhoun said, I liked Seif. Seif sat down with me and said, here are the things you're gonna like about me. And he named a few things. Here are the things you're not gonna like about me from an environmental regulatory standpoint. But then Seif did what he said. And for business people, they need to know that if these are the rules of the game and I play by the rules, then and my, I, there's a timetable. As long as they're met, I'm good. So I think from a permitting standpoint, the Commonwealth, it varies significantly. Our DEP office for the region out of Meadville is actually very good. The key there is you need to meet with them in advance, and that's what we always advise people. Don't start doing your project and then go to them. Then they're behind the eight ball. So one of the things that we do is in economic development is make sure people don't have a foot fault on the front end that puts them behind the eight ball, and then they're in an antagonistic relationship with the agencies. But setting that high bar standard of saying, we're gonna be responsive and get you the permits you need, in a, in a defined timetable that is reasonable, that's what we're talking about when we say pre-permitted in, in the sense that everything that can be done in advance is done before we know exactly what the use is for that particular piece of property. Thank you, and from your answer, I, I hear that there needs to be some reform in that permitting process, so I appreciate hearing that. Uh, Mr. Novotny, you mentioned the KOZ, and then uh, Jake followed up with the KOZs, and 15 some years ago, that program began, we all wanted a piece of that pie because we all knew that that kind of equalized the economic development uh, in our area. We still in my county have an empty KOZ lot that has all the infrastructure and nothing happening. Um, we also have a KIZ and a KOEZ which have filled to a certain extent. Do you have any idea in our region how much of our former KOZ has been utilized and Certainly, if you have all of your buildings filled, congratulations. Maybe we can start pushing some business our way. Um, Thank from, you. From a regional standpoint, I don't have that uh, approximate, approximate number, but what I did learn during that process is that um, KOZs that were designated 
<coughs> and owned by an economic development organization were successful. Ones that were uh, designated and owned by private citizens, not as much, not near as much. I mean, I, when we applied back in the early 90s or uh, early 2000s, um, we put up a zone in Cory that we uh, that we owned and operated, um, and we put one in Edinburgh that was privately held, held by two or three individuals that had 200 acres. Um, the the individuals figure, thought that they had a gold mine there, and it ran out. Uh, we didn't we didn't look at it that way. We started putting facilities up, and people were moving in, and and we put shell buildings where you can modify them to whoever goes in. So uh, in that standpoint, I think maybe part of that regulation is it's owned by you know a public entity or an economic development entity. Uh, but um, on, I'd like to leave a couple ideas <coughs> of things that come to my head, and maybe they can be acted on, or maybe they're stupid ideas. But um, I think in the, the Commonwealth owns multiple real estate throughout the, 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 the Commonwealth and the counties everywhere, and a lot of it is not being fully utilized. Um, if there were a way of conveying that property or building to economic development entities, and then if you need, I mean, if you're in a, uh, an office building, you're only using a third of it, then lease back a third of it so that we could take the rest of it and put it, you know, we'll, we'll pay taxes on it, or right now it's tax exempt. Um, and so we'll lease it out to businesses and, you know, create some jobs there in that vacant space. Um, the other thought is rather than, and uh, uh, there's a lot of focus of people going out and trying to attract new companies to the area. Um, but if you look, there's a lot of companies that are for sale all over, all over the place, in Michigan, in Indiana, in Illinois, in New York, in Pennsylvania. Um, maybe there should be some kind of a program focused on buying those companies and bringing them here. I mean, you, you can spend a lot of money trying to attract, but if you put that same <laughs> amount of money into, oh, we're going to buy you, and you make plastics part, well, this company right here also makes plastic parts. And by the way, you have some of their... Uh, clients that they'd like to have as customers. <laughs> Let's just buy you and put you next to this guy, and you know, and, and you're going to be successful all the time because you're you're helping the local company grow, and you're making a targeted investment to something that you know is available. Um, so that's just a couple thoughts. Thank you. Interesting concepts. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Representative Kaiser and then Representative Sunny. Thank you very much for the information that you presented today. It's very helpful as we look at uh, a number of different, uh, <clears throat> excuse me, a number of different policy issues. Um, obviously, there are many different components to this, and Representative Rapp had, had talked about education, and I think that is a, a key component. Uh, one of the things that we've done is looking at it from a regional aspect as the creation of the Northern Pennsylvania uh, Regional College that uh, brings community college services to northwestern Pennsylvania, of which uh, Erie is, is one of the nine counties included in that. And I think that that's going to help a great deal in the future uh, with training our workforce. So I think that's an important component. Um, you spoke uh, also, both of you gentlemen spoke about uh, incentives, whether they be grants, grant programs, loan programs, tax credits, things of that nature. I think. I think as legislators, many of us struggle with how to evaluate the effectiveness of those programs because there are many of them and, and we often, uh, we're not directly involved with them, although we often look at them and think, how effective are they truly? And so that's just a statement, but it's, it's helpful uh, when folks like you present back to us that, that you feel they are uh, effective and, and, and are working. Um, and I, I guess my, my question deals with coordinating our efforts. And, and when I sit here and I think about, and this is not an eerie situation, this is across the state, the, the, whether we're truly coordinating our efforts at economic development, when you have over 2,500 municipalities across the state, you have local agencies, you have uh, county agencies, you have regional agencies like uh, the LDDs, all of our redevelopment authorities, um, SBDCs, 
I mean, I can come up with an alphabet soup here um, of agencies that that we uh, are dealing with all all doing economic development. Are we really fracturing our efforts? And and how does that compare with other states like Ohio and New York, for example, uh, because Erie is situated, obviously, right here in the corner. Um, and if you could speak to that, I'd appreciate it. Yeah, the, um um, the one thing I would just say to your first part about incentives is that we have three revolving loan funds that are all, almost all maxed out. And so between those three funds, you're looking at, I don't know, 24 to, close to 30 million? $30 million, and it's in smaller increments. It's, it's 50 to 250, maybe some cases 500,000 um, loans. So the fact, and, and with a 1% default rate, that, that's an incentive to someone. It's not, a, it's not a grant. It's just a low interest competitive loan that can be paired up with bank financing. And so for a lot of smaller businesses, that's a big deal, getting the financing. We talked to a prospect the other day, startup company, it's in Europe, but it wants to come here. It needs a million dollars worth of machinery and equipment loan fund. We didn't have any investment capital. They need a million and a half in investment capital. When I told them we could probably do um, you know, we could cover the machinery and equipment piece through a low interest loan, maybe get you a KIZ tax credit for a hundred grand. They were ecstatic. So we didn't have to put a million bucks on the table to, to attract their interest. So I do think it's very challenging to evaluate incentives and let's not get started talking about an Amazon project, which is an anomaly um, and, and what that means. As far as coordination, let me give you an example of Erie County, okay? So we have our lead economic development team, so we get all those players that you wanna to get together. Uh, but in Erie County, the, the two entities that are locally controlled and involved in economic development presently, on a day in and day, when I say economic development, I mean to open to everybody, the entire county doing things for them and assisting them. The only two that we have are right here. The others are, you know, we have a city of Erie Department of Planning, and they have a revolving loan fund, but they're not an active economic, that means they are active in loaning money out, but they're really not stepping on us. We're feeding them leads on our outreach. The county of Erie has a planning department, but it doesn't have an economic development department. None of the municipalities have an economic development department, so it depends on the area. And then those, those other agencies that you're talking about, SBDCs are funded by the Commonwealth and the Feds. Ben Franklin's funded by the Commonwealth. Industrial Resource Center funded by the Commonwealth, National Institute of Standards and Technology and Manufacturing Extension Partnership. Um, local development districts are funded by the Commonwealth and the Feds through the Appalachian Regional Commission and EDA. So a, a lot of it is about taking advantage of the resources coming in from the Feds and so we wouldn't want to eliminate it but I totally get the coordination and I think what we're doing in Erie by getting us together on a regular basis helps to elevate that coordination. And, um, but I will say that at the end of the day, a lot of those agencies, the challenge is when their funding gets cut, they, they, they get more territorial. When they have more funding, they have a tendency to think more entrepreneurially and they work a little more collaboratively together. But when funding gets cut, you start to see people's teeth a little bit more, and we try to head that off. But it, it is challenging. Our job is to, to, to take full advantage of every tool that's out there for the benefit of the Erie County business community. Yeah, um, Ms. Jake, um, most of these regional entities and um, other entities get funding from other sources. Um, we don't. We, we get no count money from the county. We get no money from the state for operations. We get nothing, zero. The way we run our operation is like a business. We do loans, we lend money out at three and a half percent, and out of that interest spread, that's what pays our tax, our bills, and when we lease a property out, you know, that that's generates some income, but it also, because we're leasing it to a private individual, we add, you know, a tax, they pay taxes, even though we are tax exempt, we pay taxes, um, because it's the right thing to do. So, you know, we try to operate like a business because that's who we're trying to help. Yeah, and just the, the comment about Pennsylvania and Ohio, I didn't want to lose that. Jobs Ohio, the dollars that they're committing to at the state level, and then their, their complement to our Ben Franklin, I believe, is the Edison uh, Technology Centers or the Edison Groups. I, I guess 
Ohio is very, very aggressive in economic development. They, they, they put a lot of dollars in there, and they have a, they have a full-time professional development team that's a private, I think, nonprofit or a blend of government that really is aggressive in going out. And they arm them accordingly. Uh, in New York State, it was, again, the Buffalo region's exploding in part because Cuomo committed a, a billion dollars to Buffalo, the Buffalo billion. Uh, in the forms of different incentives. I'm not necessarily saying, uh, well, let me just say this. Erie would welcome a billion dollar commitment <laughs> from the Commonwealth from Pennsylvania. Um, we'll figure out how to invest it wisely for you and for all of us, so. And I'm certainly not being critical of any of those agencies. It's just when you're looking at it, and we have, we as state legislators have finite resources, it seems, uh, which, how do we evaluate which programs we're going to put money into? And, and that becomes uh, challenging. But uh, I appreciate the, the information. And it's, it's good to hear about the, the, uh, the coordination that you have going on in Erie County. And, and uh, you know, I really do think it comes back to co a coordinated effort and, and maximizing our assets. And, and as you said, having tools to, uh, to do what we need to do. So thank you so much. Still morning, yes. Good morning. Thanks for testimony. Um, I thought it was uh, very informative, actually, to tell you the truth. And, and first, I'd like to just circle back for a second um, on one of the comments about uh, money and loans and lending. And, and um, you know, is it difficult for, for businesses to get commercial loans? You know, why is it so important that, you know, the economic development locally have that money for loans i understand it sometimes it's matching money you know to, to it's to, it's to um it depends it, it it is it is usually a situation where uh frankly the banks wouldn't mind sharing the risk with that so if it's a five hundred thousand dollar project they might be on the edge of wanting to be in for 200 uh, for 500 so they go to Rick and Rick, it's not like it's a sh shaky loan, it just gives the bank a little bit. If the bank has a, has a five-star credit, they're gonna loan them all the money and, and, and we don't get involved. We only get involved when somebody maybe is, you know, needs more than the bank is willing to lend to them. And, and then it's a great partnership because the business gets what they need, the bank feels way more comfortable loaning them the money and away the business goes. And the, the one thing that is real important, I think it's the underwriting teams, it's the, the, the loan review panels of these groups. They're not rubber stamping things. They understand that these are in, you know, economic development funds, but they're not making bad loans. Uh, they, are, they are running them through the same type of analysis that you'd find in a bank, but with just a little bit of an eye towards the fact that maybe they'll be a little more risk tolerant than a, than a financial institution. But then there's a private entity called Bridgeway Capital that's come to the market, which is fabulous. And uh, I would just tell you, like five, seven years ago, we, we, um, we didn't have any working capital money in the marketplace, and today we do. But right now, if somebody comes to us with a financing need, we pretty much can meet anyone's financing need through a variety of programs at the state, the local, regional level. And uh, that's a nice thing to have checkboxed off that we don't have to worry about. When you're dealing with, with um, current businesses and helping to retain business, and you know, you had mentioned that you, know, you often connect them with parties that they really need to be connected with, um, you know, do you hear much about difficulties dealing with state government? It depends. It, you know, honestly, it really depends on the nature of the project that they're dealing with. Sometimes it, it is, it's a, a, a coin flip, I would say. I, I know of a company out here in Harbor Creek that's looking to grow and expand, and they're running into some challenges relative to environmental issues. They own the land, they want to grow and build on their own property, and they're being held back because of some environmental regulations. Um, that, that's frustrating to a company that wants to make an investment, grow jobs here, on land they own. Mm -hmm. um, so that, that would be an example of that. Um, but it really depends on, and again, I want to be very clear, sometimes the company makes, you know, creates the problem by getting started on a project without going through the appropriate, appropriate steps, and then the regulatory agency rightfully says, hey, we, we have to have this done, or you, know, you need to stop. 
But in general, I would say, and Rick is going to be able to testify to this better, I, I don't hear as many complaints about, the, the, about regulatory issues. It's more about the taxing climate and the cost of doing business in the Commonwealth of Pennsylvania. Yeah, from a regulation standpoint, we recently <laughs> lost a uh, employer of about 50 people. Um, they were, they have a corporation in uh, Mercer County, I believe it is, maybe Lawrence. Um, and they selected a site in Ohio because they were able to get permits in a week through the Department of Environmental Protection. And I, I think that's something that maybe we don't look at properly. We, we try to make sure all the I's are dotted and all the T's are crossed before they even put a shovel in the ground. Now these people are making you know, $100 million investments. They don't want, they don't want, they want to get started as quick as they can, but they don't want to be shut down a year into the operations because they screwed up on an air permit or, or something like that. So if you can speed up the, the um, permitting process, you always have the opportunity to go back and say, hey, look, you didn't do this right, and no company wants to, to stifle their investment because they didn't do it right. I mean, yeah, you'll get the, the shady couple characters, but when you're spending hundreds of millions of dollars, they're not shady. And when it comes to <clears throat> attracting new business, you know, is it really and truly just all about how much you can give them? In other words, is it that much of a competitive market on how much they can be given? That's the last thing. Yeah. That's the last item on the checklist. They need to be uh, cited where the transportation works for them, whether it's uh, air, rail, uh, uh, sea, ports, whatever. So the, the location is critical. Um, having a workforce that can do what they need done is critical. Uh, having the real estate available is critical. Um, and then if you can check all those off, then it's, you know, what yeah. can we get on, what, what else can we get? Yeah, the, um, I, I'll be very interested to see, for instance, because Amazon made a big deal of incentives, which I found a bit gluttonous. Um, I, I don't think that, that incentives are going to be the ultimate. I think that's, that is truly, I talk with corporate real estate managers. That's the last thing they talk to. At the end of the day, if you, if you, if you, really, you really have to step back. I mean, let's look at it. Um, our, one of our biggest employers, Erie Insurance, is spending $135 million on a, a corporate expansion, okay? Um, would two million bucks from the state really make or break that decision? They're making that decision based on a, not just love of Erie, they're making it based upon, because that love of Erie can only go so far in a boardroom. They're making it because it makes strategic decision for their long-term competitiveness. So don't get me wrong, I think you should give them a, you know, as many millions as they want because it's really important to Erie. But in all candor, that's a business decision. And when you're making that business decision, they're looking at, and that's, uh, I had this discussion with somebody else. At the end of the day, you're gonna see Amazon go to the place and mark my words, you're gonna hear from them. They chose that place because they saw a vision of a community and a place that fit where they were going and where they are now. They have more data than everyone. They didn't need anything from any of us to make their decision. What they didn't have is they couldn't see into, forgive the, the yeah, they couldn't see the soul of the community. They, they needed to know for sure this is a place that we can hook our arms to and they're gonna actually live the message they're putting out in all their brochures. That's where they're gonna go. The incentives will come, but at the end of the day, they're not gonna make the decision because somebody, because Jersey offered them seven billion and some other place offered them one billion. That they won't do that. It will be driven by a connection. So incentives, to me, I, again, I come back to, I come from a place of, I like the idea of incentives that are driven about investments in assets that can't be moved out of the Commonwealth of Pennsylvania. Because once you have a building, once you have an industrial park and people build structures and assets in, the commu in your communities, they can't be unplugged and taken away. So if it doesn't work out for that employer, it'll work out for the next employer. But right now, if somebody came to us and said, I need 250,000 square feet of manufacturing space, 30 feet under crane, see you later. We don't have it. We don't have that available. I need 100,000 square feet of class A office space and I'll move my company there. But I need to be in in six months. What do you got? We don't have it. wants it now. 
it's the timetable got way shorter. And a lot of people are not interested. There's a huge demand, and Rick knows this firsthand, huge demand for existing assets. People don't want to build new. They want to find something that has already been built. It's way more cost effective. If you can find a 250,000 square foot building with 30, 30 foot under, under crane, you've, you've got a gold nugget that people want. Um, and so assets like that or existing assets is where a lot of companies are looking first. There's, don't get me wrong, there's, there's new builds going on all over, but that's a, that's a huge issue. Thank you. I'd just like to touch base real quick with uh, Colleen and Mike. When, um, how much, do, you, do you weed out your repeat customers that are no-shows? Yes. Or do you? <laughs> yes. Yes, we do. We give, you, you know, one, two chances and you're done. But yet, you can't break that cycle? No. Not at all. We've initiated two, like we, last year we also initiated a drug screen process hoping to weed out those folks. I mean, it's helped. I mean, it, it, it actually has cut down on our workers' comp um, cost, which is huge for us. I mean, that's our second, actually, the workers' comp's our biggest expense, mm -hmm. you know. Um, so we've actually initiated that process, just like I said, to kind of weed those people out. But 40% of the people that come in can't pass the drug screen. Unfortunately. And that's year over year. Yes. And then the but ones that pass, and how, how big of a percentage of the ones that actually get through that hurdle just don't want to come to work? Half of them, 50% of them. Amazing. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Question begs to ask, is government making it too easy for them not to work? Anybody want to respond? Yes, they are. <laughs> um, How? Like he says, Give us it's the welfare, it's food stamps. You go to the grocery store and you see these people in front of you with two carts, they're buying better stuff than you are. They're living in, they're living in the same houses, like he says. They're living next door to the people that are working for, you know, a living. It, can We're I, not making them responsible. We, if, they're, if you're getting a check, there's got to be a cutoff point or you gotta give something back for that check. Go, go clean up the peninsula four hours a day. Go to the parks, clean them up. Yeah, the, the, one of the challenges, uh, what I would say is, is uh, 99 week unemployment was one of the biggest mistakes that was made. Um, and, and the reason is, is it was so long, and I know we were in a tough time, but what people have done is they've uh, readjusted their lifestyle and their living style. So if you're living on your own and now all of a sudden you're working, you're living with somebody and you're getting by with whatever you're getting, you've changed your, your behavioral pattern. Um, and, but, but on the same token, what I would say is, is that the, the, the other aspect of that, and this is a long-term challenge, is if you, and, and I uh, was fortunate enough not to live this, but if you've been born and raised in public housing, if you've been born and raised in an environment where you receive benefits, uh, this isn't a judgment call, it is just an, a, an observation. The culture in which you've grown up is that that is what you do. And, and, and I can give you the opposite side of that or a different side of it, but the same thing. My dad was a college professor. We had six boys, you know how many of us are entrepreneurs? Zero. It's not what we watched every day. But if somebody is an entrepreneur and you ask them, who are the significant influences in your life and what did they do? I guarantee you those entrepreneurs will cite a father, a mother, an aunt, an uncle. It could have been a side landscaping business that they did for years, but they learned entrepreneurship at home. So we have to recognize that institutional poverty and decades, it, that is a big part of what we're fighting is, is that they haven't been raised in an environment necessarily where you, you go to work. And so I think some of the policy decisions, what you don't want to do is drive more people to that environment because, and I think that that's what I thought, in my opinion, 99 week unemployment did, is, is it gave people a very safe space to be in while the economy you know, recovered, but it was too long. And, um, and, and, they, and because of the length, they just adjusted their lifestyle. Figure out how to make it work. Right. I mean, once you can figure out how to do without cable, all of a sudden, you don't need cable as much. 
We appreciate your candor. Uh, the House Policy Committee has also done hearings on welfare. We've heard this pretty chronic. These members up here all voted on a package that would have instituted the federal welfare to work that was done under Clinton, which was a 20-hour work week and or pursuing education or trying to volunteer, a two-year con uh, continuity within that and a five-year maximum. We were told through the, the hearings that Pennsylvania is one of the most liberal states in enforcement of those standards and the five-year maximum, people leave other states when they max out to come to Pennsylvania because our maximum is not enforced. Mm -hmm. That's what your legislators sitting here tried to change so the working people who are paying this into the government aren't having to pay more, and we're just asking everyone to help out a little bit more, and unfortunately, it got struck down. Representative Roy. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, one thing I'm surprised hasn't come up yet in the hearing is the you know, concept of right to work. I know recently, uh, uh, Mr. Rao, you, you had an editorial in the paper a couple months ago. Uh, you know, some companies like to have the flexibility to employ, to you know, move employees to match their business needs outside of what their normal jobs are. Some companies like to pay their best employees more than their average employees. Uh, and it's hard to do that when you're in a union environment. So uh, what do you guys see as far as, where's that on the list? We talked a lot about having actual, you know, land available, transportation, workforce, things like that. Uh, where does the right to work issue come in as far as, you know, how much that makes it tough for Pennsylvania to compete? Well, as I respond to this question, I feel a little nervous having my back to a room of people. Um, the, um, the, I, you know, I, 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 we, the Erie Regional Chamber agreed to uh, allow me to write an op-ed piece that simply proposed the idea that what if Erie County were to go to right to work? That was driven by a, uh, the concept of we would become the only geographic area in a three-state region, Pennsylvania, Ohio, New York, that would be right to work. It was totally driven by the idea that we need more jobs and specifically more manufacturing jobs in the marketplace. And that that could get Erie County looks and could get Erie County into the consideration set for projects that presently do not consider us because we're in Pennsylvania and Pennsylvania is not right to work. Um, it, wasn't, it, wasn't a, uh, it wasn't a statement about paying people lower wages or about child labor laws. Um, it, it had nothing to do with that. It was about the fact that the only thing that's going to drive wages up here for, for skilled labor over time is the competition for those workers. And right now, we have too, too many workers chasing too few jobs. There's still, and these folks can attest to it, there's, I can assure you, probably two to 3,000 jobs going unfilled in Erie County of all different types, and uh, we have way more than that chasing after them. Um, but with that said, what I would say is the issue of right to work from, our, you know, from uh, a Commonwealth Pennsylvania standpoint is totally in the hands of the legislature. Um, all I will uh, caution you is there's 28, 29 states ahead of you. When, and uh, Rick has heard me say this before. I, I tire of Pennsylvania studying every other state's you know, economic development programs only to come in after over half the states have adopted them and then coming in at 50% of the strength of the most successful program. So right to work now. In all honesty, are you going to be the last state in? Uh, or because more and more states are going in that direction. I don't think it's a panacea in any capacity. And at the end of the day, um, I, I never have felt that. I just feel as though stats show that 35% of projects looking for a location eliminate states that aren't right to work. So this is about getting 35% more looks by a, a, a universe of projects. So it's. It isn't by any means a panacea. It's something that's out there. Uh, candidly, I know it's a hot button issue, and I felt that heat uh, very straightforward. I appreciated the union members who called me on the phone and sent me emails and what they had to say, and I had some good conversations with them. This is an anti-union from my perspective at any capacity. Uh, I would love it if people would make $35 an hour in, in, in all of our jobs. I really would. But if I have a choice between a thousand jobs at 22 bucks an hour or 20 and zero jobs at 35 I'm gonna take a thousand 
And that has nothing to do with being anti-union. It has everything to do with our job in economic development is to keep and grow jobs in the marketplace. So um, that's, that's where that sits. And, and you know, as it goes forward, this has been an issue that all of you have dealt with and had in front of you and probably will for some time. And I realize how partisan it is, and I realize how politically volatile it is. And it, it seems like, you know, it, uh, from my perspective, it seems like it does put us at a disadvantage, and things might add up a little bit too. Like when you look at our climate, you know, some companies don't want to be in the middle of a big ice chest all winter. Uh, you know, you, you look at our uh, corporate net income tax rate in Pennsylvania, 9.9 percent. So you, you start adding up some of these things, and it's conceivable how some companies might decide, well, maybe we should bypass Pennsylvania. You know, highest corporate net income tax in the country. You know, they're not a right to work state. The climate's not that good. Uh, uh, now, what about other issues that haven't been talked about? Uh, are, do employers, I know we have problems with our unemployment system, uh, problems with our workers' compensation. Uh, as I mentioned, our 9.99% corporate net income tax rate. Do, do those things play into decisions much, or are those pretty minor details after the major decisions are made? Um, yeah, I mean, all of that factors into it, but at the same time, if, if um, I mean, I, I, let's just use a very straight up eerie example. We have 1,500 skilled laborers that are out of work because of the transitions at GE. Uh, I think Rick would agree with, the, with me on this. If we had a half, two half million square foot manufacturing facilities that were, you know, 30 foot under crane, we could be out shopping uh, that workforce to uh, heavy manufacturers tomorrow. Right now, our big challenge is assets. Developable land ready to go, uh, greenfield, brownfield, uh, as well as existing facilities. So, I mean, it, it really is a, a black and white game. I, I'm a part of an industrial group of um, the biggest, you know, Kellogg's and Weyerhaeuser and, and um, you know, Amazon, these folks who are picking the sites, and when you sit down with them, at the end of the day, it is all about facilities and people. That's it. That's what starts the discussion. And then these other items do factor in, but they come in after the fact. Now, with that said, they would all start looking at Pennsylvania if there was a half a million dollar investment fund that was going to go to the best projects, and that fund would only be used, it would be used in $50 million increments as long as you were bringing an investment over 100 million or over 250 million and create 500 jobs that paid 60 plus thousand dollars a year those types of things they would not turn their head to that they would absolutely be interested in something like that um, so at the end of the day though do you have the workforce i need do you have the facilities and land and building do you have the education and work you know, educational institutions i need it, it it really is that first and foremost all right, well, well, thank you for uh, giving us that, that information. That's very helpful. Th thank you. Representative Park Wetland. Thank you very much. Thanks for joining us today, and thanks for allowing us to join you. I had a, just a couple of real quick questions that may hit all of you here, but uh, <coughs> this is, I guess this would be more specific to uh, Colleen and Mike. Uh, I'm just interested in, in what types of, what specific types of jobs are, are you filling? And, uh, you know, if you could... It's all, 80% uh, of it's light industrial. So okay. CNC machinist, plastic press operators, mold setters, process techs, welders, still looking for welders. Um, that's the main, but we're looking for instructors. We've got two local schools here that are still looking for instructors and those are $20 an hour jobs and they've been open for two weeks. They're paying 20 bucks an hour for an electrical instructor and a welding instructor, and it's hard. Okay. So like I said, the professional is the same way. And, and what kind of skills specific to that, um, you know? For the instructors? Just in general, just in general. Um, some teaching background, but mostly just um, welding experience in all phases. But in, in regards to the other jobs that are available skill-wise, skill any um, kind of schooling necessary? Uh, no. Okay. The machinist, um, we got three places right now. They're training people. They start sure. off at ten or eleven dollars an hour, <coughs> as long as they got a good work history. They're training them on the job. Okay. Uh, welding. We have three, 
two different schools here in Erie that teach welding. So, okay. and those are you know eleven to twelve dollar an hour jobs. You got people out of GE now. They're starting. They're going to work for ten, eleven dollars an hour now. Their schooling's done. They're sure. they're out of funds. So my my father was a welder. So. Um, can you, uh, I guess this would maybe be a little bit uh, more geared towards uh, Rick. Can you, can you talk, Rick, about the, uh, the uh, blade money that's now going to be available? Uh, the, the blade money that's now going to be available through the uh, gaming money for the, for the county? Sure. Um, and I know uh, Representative Sonny had worked hard to have that included as part of it. And, and Kurt, if you need to chime in, too. Thank you. So we do appreciate the um, million dollars a year to fight blight in Erie County. Um, we, from a, a local level in Cory, have not established a land bank, but um, last week, two weeks ago, we purchased five properties out of tax sale, which we're going to end up demoing. Um, what we're, in, in about six years ago, we did a study of the entire county looking at blight and where, you know, it's most significant, and we found where there are concentrations of population, such as the city of Erie, Cory, Union City, where there's density, you find more blight, or at least it's obvious. Um, and if you're down, going down a country road and you see a bar old barn falling down and snow coming through the, the slats, everyone wants to take a picture of it, but it's blight. Uh, so, but the, so, the, so what we're looking at, at doing, I, I think the county's looking up at setting up a land bank, um, and I, I believe that money is going to be used to acquire and demolish um, blighted residential properties. I think we should also be looking at using it for commercial and industrial properties. And it may not even mean demolishing some of those commercial. It may mean uh, redeveloping them and putting them back into useful life. Um, the, I, I think the biggest push initially is going to be with the residential sections. Um, I think in the, the study that <laughs> Erie just completed, uh, a couple of years ago, they had how many thousand homes? Where in, in, the, in the city? It was, oh, it's it was uh, significant. Four thousand structures. Yeah. So I mean, and every one of those is a ten, ten thousand dollar, teardown bill. And that would be specific to the city, but I, it's my understanding too. The money could be obviously yeah, used throughout the county it would be too. Used countywide. Very yes. good. And okay. then what we'd like to see is, um, Gerard, Albion, Edinburgh, you know, any, any of the communities to to come to either the redevelopment authority, the land bank, um, and say, okay, we have these two properties we'd like to take care of. And so out of that, we would say, okay, well, here's the check uh, to acquire the property. And then once you do, here's the check to demo them. But you, Edinburgh, Gerard, whoever, you own the properties. We don't want to cut grass all over the county because it's, so <laughs> we leave it back to the local, um, municipalities to either have municipalities to own them or if they do have um, local groups that you know are looking at uh, taking care of blight then you know they would own them and and hopefully I, I think what then happens is if you can target these blighted properties and you can put two or three parcels together the next step is to finance um, a developer to put in a new home or an apartment complex it's not a complex but it's you know maybe a four unit a comp, uh, apartment um, so <clears throat> what you've essentially done is you've removed say three twenty or thirty thousand dollar tax assessed properties by the demolition but then you build a two hundred thousand dollar unit there and you've doubled the tax base thank you very much thank you mr. chairman thank you park before we conclude, Representative Rapp has one question, but I'm going to throw a thought out there for, to the panelists. Uh, each of these members up here are very bright colleagues of mine. If there's something that comes up later, another idea you want to share, please get on their websites to do that. Uh, when I began, began today's hearing, one of the things I said is we want to learn what we could do better as a Commonwealth. I'm also interested in what we may be doing well and maybe should do more of. Uh, that you can send us to in an email. Representative Rapp has a closing question, and then we'll close things out. When we were discussing wages, um, you know, it, it was really impacting me when you were talking about the nine to eleven dollars and the, uh, starting. But then you said, you know, welders, and you know, I think that's a pretty good wage. 
But then I have a grandson who's just got a job at Walmart in high school, and he's making $9 an hour, and, and he's still in high school. He hasn't had any training for welding or, you know, anything in manufacturing. And certainly I believe that, you know, that's a pretty good wage, and it should be. I believe in working people and incentivizing people to work. But I was actually shocked when he came home and said, oh, yeah, I'm going to get $9 an hour. And I start out, and I get a 401K, and if he gets hired permanently, I think after a year, they match up to so much of his salary. And this is Walmart. But then, you know, when we talk about Amazon and other places, because they can't get employees, they're going to, you know, more robotics, more robots going in. And so is that, is, that is the way that uh, manufacturers and warehousing uh, is looking at. If we can't get employees, we'll go to uh, technology to be able to uh, conduct business because that's what business does. They, if they can't get their needs met by employee, regular human beings, they're going to try and figure out a way to be successful because that's the entrepreneurial spirit. But, um, yeah, you know, I've uh, looking at the wages, and I think it should be, you know, my grandson at 17 thought, and I think, wow, that's pretty good, working at Walmart and being a high school kid. So, but is it is it enough for a welder who has to go to training or in a trade? Your I'm, entry, I'm just asking. Your entry level just going asking. in as entry a welder level. at $11, I mean, you're going to work your way up. I mean, Walmart just raised their rates this year, just like a lot of our companies have raised their rates because they're fighting for people. And, I mean, we all started somewhere. You start, you prove yourself, you go to work every day, and you make yourself a better person, and you move up. I agree. I was, I was very surprised myself, though, when I saw how much he started off at Walmart. And, but then, uh, yes, it's a couple dollars more an hour, but it takes... My son was, was a welder. He had to go through a lot more schooling. He went to Williamsport uh, to be a welder than just walking into Walmart and doing whatever. And I think that that is something that every manufacturer and every business needs to grapple with, which is to attract and retain the workforce that you need. Because if you look at a competitive business, they usually have a very high retention rate of their employees, people that can come in and learn their business and continue to grow with it. So every employer has to look at the number of bodies they need, how the work is done, and what they can pay. And I think you could see some businesses contract in order to elevate the wages and hold on and redesign how they do things to be competitive in the long run. But I, look, I agree. Uh, you're not gonna get people to walk into a manufacturing shop floor in general for nine bucks an hour if they have years of experience it's going to be extremely difficult it, and I, that's just reality and, and i know that we've talked to people when they're posting jobs through the career link and the like and we say look you got to get that wage up to 12. you're not going to get anybody applying at 950. um and and so i it, this issue of wages it the, there's certain Walmart and here in Erie, Wegmans. Wegmans pays nine nine fifty to start for high school kids. That's what you're competing with, and you, every employer needs to look at that. I think every employer out there should seriously consider doing a profit sharing plan as part of the compensation package to help engage those employer employees and hold on to them. One of our most successful manufacturing operations here in Erie, forty percent of the compensation that the employees receive comes through that that profit sharing plan, they have zero turnover, and they are all vested in making sure that that company is successful. So there's, there's a lot of different ways, but this issue of getting skilled labor, that these folks can help find, you know, they, they kind of told you some of the horror stories, but they equally found people that had the right work ethic, right cultural fit, and they, got, they stayed in there. Now, how do you keep that person in there? And that's a, that's a big, you know, big challenge, and wages is gonna, and benefits are gonna be a big part of that. 
say that hoping that my grandson would stay <coughs> at, and there's nothing wrong with working but uh, certainly I don't want him to think that hey just I might as well just stay here because if I go train for that job you know I'm not going to make that much more I'm just I'm just throwing that out there that uh, I, I was amazed that that's what uh, the wage was thank you thank you so very much I'll just add to that too if I may um, and I can probably attest more to this, but basically how our agency works is um, if you can get somebody to work three months, if you're a good employee, you show up every day, most of our client companies will hire those people on. And he can attest he's been here 19 years. Some of our, um, Plastec is one of our biggest clients. Some of the supervisors there are people he put to work 10 years ago. Mm -hmm because they're, they, they stay, they're invested, you know? So that does happen, but um, the, the, our struggle is getting them to work, I mean, sometimes our struggle is getting them to work for the first week, you know? It, you, you can't even believe it, you know? And then you have the other, of course we do have a lot of other side of the spectrum where we get great employees. You know, they go in, they get a job, boom, they're gone. We see them, they're gone, because they're hired on. They're scooped up quick. You know, so we do, I mean, while it seems like there's a lot of negativity, I mean, we do have, I mean, we put a lot of people to work. You know, it's just that sector that we just, you know, it's an issue. Well, thank you. This has all been very, very informative. Again, I want to encourage you to share additional information you may have, or if you tell somebody that you're here today and they say, well, geez, I'd love to have been there, have them contact the websites of all the legislators you see up here, share their information. I'd like to thank, thank Harbor Creek for Township for hosting us today. Again, thank our RV. Yeah, our RV. Our, uh, oh, yes, our communications crew for helping us. Representative Sonny, thank you very much for hosting us. Reed, your staff has been great. Thank you, Chairman Benninghoff. Just like to, again, thank the testifiers. I thought uh, it was very informative. And um, um, we look forward to any other additional information that you might have. And this meeting is adjourned. <laughs>